For more than three decades, the iconic BMW M3 has been the very benchmark of the high-performance executive sedan market. And now there's this, the G80 generation M3 competition. But in more than 30 years of evolution, plenty of rival brands have tried to come along and take away the M3's crown, including a certain pretty Italian. Ah yes, the Alfa Romeo Giulia Q. When this car was introduced in 2017, it completely changed what we thought a sports sedan should be capable of. But has the game moved on in the last four years? Has the BMW M3 now overtaken it? That's what we're here to find out today. Woohoo! <laughs> Well, Andy, I feel like we should start with the elephant in the room. One of the things that people have been talking about most with this generation M3, and that is, of course, the way it looks. Yeah, I think almost every part of this car is, is really handsome, apart from the front end, which I just recoiled when I first saw it. As did I, as did everyone. The internet went completely off its chops about it. Um, it's a bold move. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I think I was wrong with that first impression. It's it's got real presence, the front end, and I think we'll grow to like it. Like some of those old bangle designs, the E60 M5, when that came out, everyone hated that thing. And now you look at it and you think, ah, he was onto something there. Totally. But there's plenty to talk about on the interior as well. Lots going on in here. This one has been fitted with the optional carbon pack, hasn't it? Yes, yeah, including these crazy seats that are actually a lot more comfortable than they look at first, but getting in is a bit of a mission, isn't it? Climbing over that bolster on the side. We spent a fair bit of time in this car yesterday and I got in and out several times, several million times, and I swear I've broken a couple of ribs because as you land in it, this side bolster is so aggressive. Yeah, the, the, the whole look of this interior, I, I think BMW have taken a slight leaf out of Mercedes's book and, and tried to jazz up the visual impression, give it that showroom wow factor in here because it's certainly a lot more extrovert than the previous generation car, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. There's tons of technology. We've got obviously this huge touch screen in the middle, complemented by another fully digital display down here. Looks like they're taking a leaf out of Audi's virtual cockpit there. But my question is, is it a little bit intimidating when you get into the M3 cabin? Because you're confronted with just red switches everywhere, modes, options. There's a lot to take in. And I find it a bit confronting. Yeah, there is a hell of a lot to get to learn with this car. There are layers and layers and layers of it. Like both of us were completely bamboozled when we switched it into M mode and then couldn't switch it out of M mode without yeah, switching yeah. the car off at first. So yeah. some of the things are very counterintuitive. Yeah. And also while we're talking about complexities, if you haven't seen our drag race video of this car and the Alfa Romeo, then watch it now because we go through the protracted process of putting it into launch control and it's about a four and a half hour process, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, settle in with a beer and some popcorn for <laughs> that one, you'll be there a while. No, it's, it, there's a, there, there is a lot to learn about this car and, you know, this car's knocking on for 1800 kilos and have you ever seen so much carbon fibre in a car that weighs 1800 kilos but it's big isn't it this is bigger on the road bigger footprint than the old e60 m5 yeah yeah so it's, it's, it's huge it's a big unit up front we've got the three liter straight six twin turbo it's essentially an evolution of the previous m3 engine but in competition guys it's producing 375 kilowatts which is ample and 650 newton meters which again if you need more than that then there's not a lot we can do for you <laughs> that's immense yeah, it just pulls for days, doesn't it? You get it in third gear and, oh. <laughs> oh. I don't know what gear that was. I was too scared to look. That was actually fourth. So you were saying earlier, you think it's got, um, it limits torque in gears one and two. It feels like it, yeah. It uh, does, because once you get into third gear, it just seems to have exactly the same amount of muscle and acceleration. And I know I should hate the fact that sound is being piped into the car, but when it sounds like that, I, I can't really have any contention against it. They've done a great job there. Yeah, yeah, and it, it means that you don't have to ring the engine right up to six or seven, 7,000 RPM totally. for it to sound good. Yeah, exactly right. There's virtually zero turbo lag. Like, it's just so responsive. And it's bolted to the other significant difference with this generation M3. It's now got a proper automatic gearbox, isn't it? It does, it does. Some people like that. Some people are not so keen on it. Um, I found that it 
it denied me a couple of shifts yesterday that I'd have probably got a downshift in an old twin clutch, but I think there are other benefits to this gearbox that overall I've, I've got no problem with it. For me, this gearbox kind of marks the end of DCTs because it's so fast. If you hadn't told me, I'd probably, yeah, other than it denying you a gear every now and then, I can't tell that it's a conventional auto. It's so rapid to swap cogs. Yeah, what did you think of the steering the first time you drove? I, I thought it felt a little bit pointy, but I kind of grew into it very quickly. I, I instantly took to it. BMW has copped a lot of flack for the way its steering feels, and particularly the previous generation um, F80 M3. I thought that was warranted and justified. Not at all in here. It's shod with Michelin uh, Pilot Sport Cup 2 tyres, so it's a serious tyre. And I feel like this car really couldn't cope with anything less. The chassis has got such a lot in it, you really need to pair it with a tyre with as much grip. And the only limits of that, obviously, is we found with our drag racing efforts in less than perfect conditions. God, it's a lot of tyre, isn't it? It is. 19s at the front, 20s at the back on this one. But even in the horrendous conditions that we were drag racing this car, the launch control mode and those tyres somehow managed to sniff out some grip and get going. It was, it was uncanny. I would, I'd have thought that would just been sitting there spinning its wheels for days. For me, this has buried any of the ghosts and the demons of the previous generation. It felt, I was worried that the M3 was kind of losing its path, but this is a true return to character for the uh, G80 generation. Yeah, and, and it just does the fundamentals so well, and it rides acceptably. It's not overly firm, and the body control at the same time, the way it goes through a corner so flat. Yeah, it just talks to you through and through. It really is, it's so complete. Could you live with it day to day? That's a question that a lot of people will ask, you know, because on the outside, to many people, it's a four-door sedan. Could it do the daily grind as well as roads like this? I think it could. The combination of that gearbox and, and the ride quality is such that I could drive this every day, I think. I could too. As you say, the ride is beautifully tuned. For me, what this car does so well over the previous generation M3 is, it, it's broader, it's softer end of the spectrum, is more comfortable, but at the really pointy sharp end, it's become even more focused. And that yeah. must have been so tremendously difficult to do, even with the last generation that wasn't perfect, but still very, very close. The other thing it does, it disguises its weight really well, you know. This is a, a big, heavy car, and it, it gets up on its toes, and it's, it's really agile. And it's only when you start getting really crazy with the thing, sliding it around and stuff like that, that you realize that you've got a lot of physics working with you there. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and we found that the M Dynamic traction control mode is probably the sweet spot. Oh, that's near genius. It's beautiful. It makes you feel like a hero, and it will allow you to have as much as the BMW knows you've got. You know, and once it finds those limits of talent, then it says, okay, over to me. And that's brilliant. It, it enables you to find limits of this car. And as you say, when you do, you realize it's not all just electronics. It is a whole lot of car for a price, which brings us on to the Alpha, which is a significantly cheaper car. It has a tough act to follow. It does. The game might have moved on and left the Alpha behind. Um, we need to uh, drive them back to back and find out if that's the case, Dan. So while the M3 is pretty much all new, this one's not had a whole lot of changes, has it, Dan? No, not since 2017 when this car was um, launched in Australia. It has had a light update, so we've got a slightly bigger screen here. Not that it feels that big still because it's behind this panel, which is huge, and it feels like you're gonna get a massive screen behind it. It's actually a, a lot smaller than its boundaries. And the interior has had a bit of an update with some leather added and bits and pieces, but otherwise, um, it's largely the same. And the most important part, the mechanicals, the drivetrain is also unchanged. Yeah, not a lot really needed changing there though, did it? It's just such a beautiful package. It really is, yeah. Like, what's the expression if, if it ain't broke? And that's certainly the case with that phenomenal engine. So it's a 2.9 litre twin turbo V6 under the bonnet, producing exactly the same amount of kilowatts as the BMW, 375. Yep. But the torque is different. Yes, it's 600. A paltry 600, 600. Newton meters. Like, it's still a massive amount. But what I like so much about this engine, the sound is phenomenal. Just flick it into... Yeah, I've just went okay. up into race and it's... Oh, it just... That is amazing. But unfortunately, the best place to enjoy that engine is from outside. 
the other thing I love about this engine is the throttle response. It is absolutely instant. I don't think I've driven a, a turbocharged engine with less lag. No, those two little IHI turbos that are bolted to this just spin up almost instantly. They're, uh, they're excellent. It's got a carbon prop shaft as well, so they're trying to keep all those rotational masses and reciprocating masses to the very minimum in this car. Without this car coming back in and saying, no, we need ride comfort, we need it to be a little bit more pliable on the road, every other manufacturer would have just continued on to what I can essentially predict would have been GT3 cars for the road. Totally unlivable, bone crushingly stiff. This said, no, no, we can do it a different way. And it's still, look at how the thing goes around corners. It is, it's, it's no compromise really. No, and you look at some of the best sports cars today and you might think of a, a Porsche 911 or an Alpine A110 or something like that. And this is in that class because it shows that you can have a car that handles and you can have a car that rides and it can be the same vehicle. Definitely. This one, part of that, as we were saying in the BMW, this one, part of this recipe of good handling is some serious tyre. What have we got? P0? P0 courses, yeah, 19285 on the back, 245 up front. They require a little bit of warming up, but uh, the handling balance of the car, it's got a 50-50 weight distribution and it's, right. it's just so benign. You can take enormous liberties with it in race. The one thing I miss is in race, you get all the sporty noises and all that, but there's no ESC safety net at all. <laughs> you, you, you're on your own. and Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a wonder that this car has still got its bumpers attached, um, given that. Other things like that steering wheel is so much more slender than the BMW. It's been revised for this year. There's a few more controls, but it's still just a simple three-spoke wheel with Alcantara and leather. And with it, you feel that you're guiding the car into corners with your fingertips, whereas the BMW, you feel like you're, you're hefting a baseball bat or something. <laughs> You know, the handshake with the car is more finessed than the BMW. It yes. feels more elegant somehow. Um, perhaps it could do better with seat support. Obviously, the optional carbon fiber um, pews in the BMW are super supportive. This feels a little bit more comfort geared. Yeah. If yeah. you could sort of match it for support, then I, I reckon I'd be feeling a little bit more encouraged to push things further in here. They are both so different in their nature. Um, one thing notably is the BMW gets carbon ceramic brakes. Uh, um, yeah. And the thing I don't like about the BMW braking setup is the rear brakes are carbon ceramic rotors, but they've got sliding calipers. Does that just, is that just me being a snob or does that seem like a really weird pairing? Yeah, it does. I, I think BMW claim it's, it's effective for what they need it for, but it, it does look weird. Um, the brakes on this are a bit strange, aren't they? They're, in what way? Just the low speed grabbiness of oh, them. Yeah. That takes a little bit of getting used to. And some people, when they drive one of these cars out of a dealership, they, they, they don't get past that. Yes, so this has got the brake-by-wire system that was introduced. First car in the world to have brake-by-wire. It's not a complete disconnection of the brake pedal from the master cylinder, um, but it's an evolution on the way there. The thing that makes me worry for the Julia is, is what has always been the case, that maybe people don't trust an Alfa Romeo at this price point. And in here, after you get out of the BMW with all the bells and whistles, it feels quite spartan, it feels quite simple, doesn't it? Yeah, but for me that has kind of, that's a bit of the appeal. Uh, certainly f when you haven't spent a lot of time in the car, it feels far more approachable for me. Yeah. I feel like the purist in me and the enthusiast would love to be able to say, as I've always wanted to, oh yeah, I definitely have the Alpha over the BMW because it's, it's, it's more real, it's more visceral, and it's a car for enthusiasts, but actually I probably would go the BMW. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, at the end of the day, we've got to come back to that question. Do people really care? Um, <laughs> you know, you've seen that a lot of people just want a loud V8 and they'll buy an AMG and completely overlook this vehicle. And I can see a lot of people overlooking it in favor of the M3. And, you know, I'm, I'm not absolutely heartbroken about that because the M3 is a truly excellent car and it deserves to sell very well. But uh, there's still something to be said for this one, isn't there? Absolutely, and the sad thing is is that we now know the Giorgio platform that this car is built on is no more. There's not much more that that platform will roll out underpinning. And that, for me, is deeply sad because it, it's, it's what made this car possible and it will always be a, a profoundly good car. Yeah, that was a, what, five billion euro investment and it hasn't really, well, you'd say it hasn't really paid fruit, but, but you look what it has done and it has rehabilitated the entire image of Alfa Romeo for keen drivers. So maybe there is a silver lining there. Perhaps. And ultimately, you know, the benefits of what this car 
has done will echo for decades down in this particular segment. Anyway, that's enough chat. I think the most important thing is if we get some scores on the doors, Andy. Yep. The M3 and Julia Q are two of the most fun cars money can buy, but the Alpha's incredible purity and character gained it a fraction more in the points. And it was almost as tight in the handling stakes too. The BMW though was the one that offered the sharpest combination of dynamics, both on the limit and at lower speeds as well. The BMW not only has more kilowatts under its bonnet, but peak power is accessible as well. And it's the BMW that takes the power prize. Both cars take regular sedans for their underpinnings, and that means plenty of practicality including room for five, a big boot and day-to-day -day usability. It's a dead heat here. There's no ignoring that these two cars are very closely matched, but the BMW costs about 15 grand more to get into. That's why the Alpha represents a little better value. It should come as no surprise that when all the scores are counted, the incredibly well-rounded and accomplished BMW M3 competition and Alfa Romeo Giulia Q scored an identical 22.5 out of 25. Ow. <laughs> you saw nothing. Oh no, let the grease spot on. <laughs>